You guys have been fantastic and brilliant. Peter Onip and Ed Gordon Reed. Uh, Fawn Brody was a, a counterintuitive uh, historian and vociferously uh, uh, condemned by uh, people at Monticello and some of the historians of the time. Can you talk about her imp impact in this whole study about uh, Sally Hemings? Well, I suppose <laughs> that should be me. Uh, <laughs> hey, you either. Well, do you, you want, want to a break? No. I'll start it. And, she'll, it. She'll, uh, and I'll leave an ellipse and she'll pick up. Uh, Fawn Brody's uh, book in 1973 was widely condemned by people like Douglas Adair, Duma Malone, Merrill Peterson, uh, because it was an egregious example of what they called psychohistory, in which you'd take a random comment about the, the, the uh, color of the, of the earth in the Netherlands and deduce from that Jefferson's uh, attraction to Sally Hemings. It, that was the, the showpiece argument against Fawn Brody. But in fact, she had done some very good research. Uh, they were cherry picking in their criticisms. This was a reading, it was an interpretation, but she was, well, as we now know, she was right. Uh, she always was there as a counterpoint to the over the top defensiveness of the so-called Jefferson establishment. And that opened the door for uh, Annette to walk through because that denial that Jefferson could possibly have done that, that should have rung false. It should have been questioned. But this was a moment in American history in which uh, particularly uh, Southern white liberals were not anxious to have the image of Jefferson tainted. He was so crucial to the American conception of democracy in the wake of the Cold War uh, that to bring the saint down and particularly, ironically, and given in light of our discussion, to offer a version of Jefferson. They say, how could he do that in front of his own daughters and grandchildren? How could, he, how could he be involved in such a relationship? And that was supposed to be a conversation ender right there, because it's a rhetorical question. And uh, that's where I promised my ellipsis. Here it comes. No, oh, OK. Uh, no, so she was crucial to all of this. I mean, and the part of the problem with the book, as Peter um, alluded to, is that in the midst of some really good research, there was some other stuff that was overreaching, and that's what they focused upon instead of what, you know, the parts of it that, well, she was actually taking the words of Madison Hemings and other mm -hmm. people seriously. So she's crucial um, to, you know, keeping the, uh, well, it's crucial to my work and crucial to keeping the story open, I think. Um, so thank you all both for your lovely presentation. I really enjoyed the conversation. I was curious about the ending when you guys were talking about um, the implications of Jeff and Ronia thought for our current election cycle and our current political climate, and especially with regards to law, because I feel like Jefferson, um, in light of the Marbury of Madison decision, you usually see as him as coming out as the loser and his perspectives on law and the world and the citizen's responsibility with regards to the American legal system kind of coming out on the bottom, but I think that especially considering the hard confirmation that we're currently getting with Supreme Court justices and the increasing politicization of the court, I was wondering what Jefferson would have to say about our current situation and if you would have any solutions to that. Well, I think he would be not happy um, with the Supreme Court that he would think is sort of a super legislator, mm -hmm. legislature today, that's sort of an odd notion. Um, it's undemocratic. That it, it's undemocratic. So I think he obviously felt that every branch of the government had the right to determine whether or not something was constitutional. Uh, the notion of leaving it to the Supreme Court, but at least the question is what do you, what's the alternative, yeah. what do you do? I mean, it's, it's strangely enough, the thing that he, he would see as anti-democratic, it's one of the things that's kept us, kept the country together. Uh, a very you know, volatile, large country when there's a dispute, uh, Bush v. Gore, uh, not happy about the opinion, but they said it, and you think of other places, people might have gone out and gotten guns and had a real fight about it, but people said, okay, and let it go. So I think he would be upset about <laughs> giving so much power to the judiciary, but I think if he understood the context, the country, mm -hmm. what that does to have people believe in the rule of law and to accept this notion, uh, it might temper his uh, 
apprehension a and bit. You might say his fundamental commitment to the values he articulates in the Declaration is predicated on stability and continuity, and he would acknowledge that we can forget these things. We can forget majority rule, government by consent, equal rights. It's very easy in practice to run roughshod over those things that ought to be sacred. Uh, so I think there's a doubleness to Jefferson here. Democracy, we think of instant response to what the people want, yet isn't democracy also uh, cherishing a tradition that's handed down, values that have been handed down through the generations? I don't want to sound like some kind of wild patriot here, but uh, continuity is okay. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. I need that reassurance. Uh, but uh, the idea that, that there is a something we need to pass on to our children, that there is something sacred about our responsibility, our stewardship, as he would put it when he talks about generational sovereignty. Well, I think uh, Annette's exactly right. Uh, the institutional ways in which we make that happen, that some kind of higher law, even if the interpretation of that higher law seems, what? Uh, the, the idea that we have procedures without some kind of decision being made that's final and determinative, you can't have a united nation. You can't have real sovereignty in a world that you have to have sovereignty in. in plus, the concept of ordered liberty. Liberty is important, but there has to be order to it. And that that is something, you know, whatever problems we have with the court, uh, with this idea, uh, something could be very, very valuable could be lost if people did not, you know, did not adhere to that. First of all, I want to say this was a brilliant discussion, one of the best I've ever heard. Um, and uh, I think one of the most brilliant things I ever heard was said today over and over again, and that is uh, how Jefferson saw himself. Now, Socrates says, know thyself. And what I'm still confused about with Jefferson is does he really know himself or does he see himself as the person he should be? or wants to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, you want to start with that? Well, I'll start with you that. You start with that. Okay. I think well, I well, would say uh, I love the question, and I particularly love the comment before that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> say that again. It's <laughs> fishing for again. compliment. But, uh, fishing for compliment. I think as uh, Annette introduced this idea of self-fashioning before, we take the self as a given. It's the way we start thinking about the world. We, we train our children to have a sense of self, all notions of uh, rights, responsibilities, living in the modern world for us depend on a highly developed sense of self. And now we even have a form of photography known as the selfie. Uh, but the self is not something that is hardwired into humanity. Uh, it's very much an invention of the Enlightenment and its aftermath. Uh, it has to do with redesigning the way homes are organized so that you have, as Virginia Woolf had, a room of your own. That idea of vernacular architecture, which enables the emergence of a sense of self, which is largely based on the idea of privacy, of distance from others. That's absolutely crucial for Jefferson. It's the way he designs his house. So I, I would say, rather than his looking at himself and saying, oh my God, what a failure I am as a human being, uh, he would know that he was, uh, as a self-fashioning individual, a, a very autodidactic person who was learning uh, every, he said, a hard student throughout his life. He kept reading and thinking that this was a work in progress, progress being the operative word. He was getting closer Understanding with all due modesty and humility, you'll never get there, but he was working on it, he would say throughout his life. So I think far from feeling disappointed in himself, that's his big project is to become a self. And I think uh, Jefferson's greatest legacy we haven't really talked about is this sense of self for better or for worse. That is, we cherish our rights as individuals and sometimes I think in a very exaggerated way that we have a right, we got rights to everything now. Uh, well, there are ways in which this notion of a self can be distorted and perverted. I think for Jefferson, the self, as he imagined it, was the threshold to connections with other selves. So even the notion of self can't be isolated from a conception of society. That's all emerging in Jefferson's time. It's not something that you can predicate as being the way people would necessarily think. Yeah. 
he's becoming. And we, we do have this developed sense of you know, looking at ourselves. I think, you know, as you were saying, the well, important thing, myself, and the important I, thing I to is to keep changing, to keep improving. And so there's this self-improvement is sort of the watchword. So he's never a self that's standing still. Um, it's, he, he would know his preferences one over the other, but it's really about becoming a better person, to becoming as enlightened as he could, as he could be. Um, I'm only on page 550 of Ron Chernow's book about Hamilton, um, but I'm seeing Jefferson in a whole new light, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on his picture of Jefferson. Well, I mean, Jefferson is the anti-Hamilton yes. in Chernow. I mean, and Chernow has a very, obviously, very positive, he sees the world through the eyes of Hamilton, uh, and he calls Jefferson Dr. Pangloss, right? That's the, the chapter, Dr. Pangloss. Mr. Pangloss and uh, Dr. Pangloss. And I think it's, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's an entirely fair portrayal. I mean, there's a tendency and to sort of play the battle of the founding fathers, that if you are interested in one, you have to not like the other. <laughs> uh, and that's just not, I, I just don't think it's necessary. I mean, I enjoyed Ham, I enjoyed the book, Hamilton. But I do think the picture of Jefferson is not is seen through the eyes of someone who is promoting Hamilton. I will mention of Hamilton. Uh, was there any connection with Jefferson and our base 10 uh, financial system with Hamilton coming from British Caribbean, Jefferson maybe more influenced by sin teams? Um, and on a radically different question, <laughs> uh, is there any basis of the deathbed, purported deathbed pledge for Jefferson not to take another wife as he was losing uh, his wife? Uh, the only evidence for him, it comes from the Hemings family. Sally Hemings and her sister say that that's what he did. But other than that, we don't, there's no. You know, Is it implausible? No. Well, he's, no. no, it's not, not implausible. At not at all. It's not implausible, I mean. That was their understanding. No, I mean, it's, they understood a lot of stuff. Well, yeah. it's, it's not implausible in the sense. She had had two stepmothers, and she, and according to their story, they said she did not, it was not because I want Thomas all to myself in eternity. Uh, it was, I didn't want another woman over my children. And so you don't know if she had had a bad experience with stepmothers. She was very close to her sisters, her half-sisters. But um, no, other than that, we have nothing. See, we, you know, Jefferson doesn't, I mean, I, he destroyed the letters um, that she wrote to him and that he wrote to her. So we don't have any written documentation from the Randolph family about this, um, but we, we don't. As for the currency, that's an obviously enlightened change to make, right? Uh, and any day now, we're gonna abandon Miles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I think Jefferson uh, thought there would be magic in the names you used and the measures you used mm -hmm. that they could better conform to our emerging understanding of nature rather than being inherited ways of measuring things in marketplaces that go back centuries. Let's have units of measure that are in accord with the cosmic design. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Thank you both very much. Yeah. <laughs>